Hello and welcome to India's World. The killing of a Congolese student, Masonda Olivier, and attacks on African students and professionals have tarnished India's image. The president of the African Students Union in India, Abdul Brahim, has said, and I quote, These students are the future leaders of their country. If they are mistreated and insulted, can you imagine what will be the future of India-Africa relations? Unquote. These unfortunate developments directly threaten India's carefully cultivated strategic and trade relationship with African countries, especially over the last 10 years. India has about 25,000 students from Africa at present. India is also an integral part of the African Union's Africa Capacity Building Foundation. Almost 50% of Indian grants to Africa are in the IT and education sectors. These attacks put the larger relationship at grave risk and have triggered diplomatic outrage among African diplomats in India. The growing tension assumes significance as there are more than 1 million people of Indian origin living in Africa and Prime Minister Narendra Modi is also set to make his first official visit to Africa in July. Today we are discussing the consequences of the racism and cultural ignorance faced by Africans in India. My guests today are Ambassador Satyabrat Pal, a distinguished diplomat. He's been India's envoy to Pakistan, South Africa and Deputy High Commissioner to London and Dhaka. He was also India's Deputy Permanent Representative to the United Nations and member of the National Human Rights Commission. Ambassador HHS Vishwanathan, he was India's envoy to Ivory Coast and Nigeria with concurrent accreditation to Niger, Guinea, Sierra Leone, Cameroon, Benin and Chad, among other African countries. And we have with us Ambassador Neeraj Srivastava. He has served as India's ambassador to Denmark and Uganda. He's also served in Indian missions in Syria, United States, Libya, Saudi Arabia and Canada. I welcome you gentlemen to this discussion. Ambassador Paul, let me begin with you. Now, this killing of young Olivier is not the first such incident where Africans have been attacked. Uh, in February, a 21-year-old Tanzanian woman was stripped uh, in uh, Bangalore. Uh, a few months before that, uh, two African men were beaten up in uh, New Delhi because they didn't want people to take their pictures. Then you, in January 2015, you had a minister of the Delhi government raiding an area where uh, some of the Africans live, accusing them of drug peddling and of prostitution. Now tell me, why are these attacks taking place in this manner now? Well, you know, these incidents that you listed are simply those where things have gone beyond uh, being simply intolerable levels of behavior into crimes. But if you speak to Africans who have been in India, particularly African students, and we used to hold these iTech days, as we used to call them in our missions abroad, where we met the iTech community, alumni from Indian institutions who'd returned to their countries. Very rarely did Africans who had been in India speak of their experience with any warmth. They spoke precisely of this, of institutional <coughs> racism, of various levels, but they were not treated at all well. And uh, it simply reflects poorly on us as a nation that racism is so instinctive and so deep-rooted in us that we are unable to welcome Africans in our midst with any warmth, with any openness. Okay. Ambassador Vishnathan, historically, India and Africa relations are built on opposition to colonialism, uh, opposition to racial discrimination. Now, could it be that the solidarity between India and Africa remained at the level of our uh, leaders, both in India and in Africa, and never percolated down to the, the people of India? Actually, you are asking that there are two levels. One is at the national level, as country to country, and country to continent, our relations are very good. But at a societal level in India, there is a great lack of awareness about Africa. This also goes back to our school days. We hardly had anything about Africa in our syllabus either African history or African politics. Now, to what Ambassador Paul said, it's absolutely true. These are only the recent events, but these have been going on for a long time. And these are the extreme cases. But uh, add to this the daily uh, racial slurs and insults that the Africans face. You talk to the Africans, they'll tell you, and they are not even reported. So that is the problem. Okay, uh, Ambassador uh, Shivasta, why are Indians racist towards uh, Africans? And why do the same Indians complain against racism when they are abroad? Aren't Africans and Indians on the same side of the divide as far as racism is concerned in the world? Well, that should be true. But you are saying that uh, Indians also ex experience racism in some countries. Uh, but 
I mean, it could be related to the color of your skin, where fairness of, you know, uh, fair skin is given a great deal of importance in India, for example. And a less, you know, less fair skin is considered less than a fair skin. So that could be, you know, you know when you take the whole spectrum, of, at, at one end you have absolutely fair and the other end you have absolutely... Yet, yet the, the racism against Africans is not the kind of prejudice these North Indian, so-called uh, North Indian uh, uh, wheatish colored people have against uh, people of South India. Yeah, true. Uh, let me just say one more thing, that the first generation of African students who studied in India during the 50s, uh, they were personally, for example, uh, met by Prime Minister Nehru and they were inspired in their struggle for anti-colonialism and anti-apartheid. And I have met in Uganda some ministers and senior, senior officials of that generation who speak very fondly about their experience in India okay. and who have, pos who have positive experience also. Okay. So I would not like to make a very sweeping generalization. All right. Surely the situation might have changed now. Yeah. You have more students and so on and so forth. But at the same time, let me also say that during my tenure in Uganda, I still found that a large number of African students, want, Ugandan students wanted to study in India, including the children of these first generation okay. leaders. Okay. You know. Um, um, Ambassador Paul, if the attacks on African students and professionals in India are of a, a matter of serious concern, then why is it that the Prime Minister of India has not uh, spoken out against them? I mean, he's, he's known to go to the radio and do his radio broadcast called Man Ki Baat, where he talks about exam stress and various other things. I mean, don't you think, uh, you know, this should be taken up at the highest level and the PM should tell people how to respect the uh, you know, the dignity of uh, our African guests. I'm, I'm glad you said that because uh, in an earlier, in, 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 on, on another television show when soon after this happened, this is exactly what I said, that this is something where the Prime Minister, simply because he is such a superb communicator, needs to take the lead. This is clearly something that is going to have an impact and will impact on an outreach program for which he deserves the utmost credit getting all African heads of state here and following up. Uh, and, and this is something that he needs to do. Uh, and I hope he does it. Okay, let's hope he does that. We need to take a break at this point. We'll be back again in a bit. Stay with us. Don't go away. Welcome back. We're discussing racist attacks on African uh, students in India, African professionals, uh, and their impact on India-Africa relations. Uh, Ambassador Vishwanathan. Uh, what do these repeated attacks on Africans in India mean for India-Africa relations? In what way can the harassment and abuse of visiting uh, African students and professionals um, make or mar the diplomatic effort that's being made for you know, more than a decade in a concerted manner now? See, in my view, there is no one-to-one -one <coughs> correspondence that uh, there is one attack immediately, it's going to affect our trade. Or well, there have been several attacks. I'm coming to that. But if there are attacks over a period of time, Invariably, it will affect in the sense that the African leaders are also responsible to their people. For example, when uh, Indian students were uh, hit in uh, Australia, there was tremendous pressure on our political uh, elite to do something about it with Australia. So the African leaders will be under pressure. Yep. But here, I would also refer to some of the narratives in the newspapers and in the commentaries that such attacks will affect our trade with Africa. Such attacks will affect our entry into the United Nations Security Council as a permanent member. So such attacks should not take place. I am totally against this kind of argument. Racist attacks per se are bad, irrespective I, no, no, I, of good I, relations or I, bad I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Who could disagree with that? But let me ask Ambassador Shivasta this. Will these racist uh, attacks impact uh, trade and investment? or will they not in, uh, uh, impact them at all? Or will they impact them in a long-term sense? Well, uh, it will impact India's image in Africa, which is <clears throat> important. Uh, and because just as Ambassador Vishwanathan mentioned, I think that's a very good 
example, the concern which uh, was felt in India when Indian students were attacked in Australia. I really don't think that you know there is a direct relationship between uh, you know between these attacks and trade and investment. Uh, uh, it's uh, it would be oversimplification to say that, but. At the same time, it is important how you are perceived in Africa, how Indians are perceived, and particularly in the long term, uh, you know, it, it could have um, unexpected consequences. So it is not a matter to be taken lightly. Okay. That's what I would like okay. to say. Ambassador Paul, why is it that there's an attempt to see these attacks on uh, African nationals as localized crime? This is the narrative that's coming from the state, from the government and not racism. Are we uh, brushing racist behavior under the carpet as we are sort of normally inclined to do whenever anything uncomfortable comes up? Yes, I, I, I think there is a lot of that in the, in the official response. It's a discomfort with accepting something that is so evil that it could be, show, that it could be so prevalent at the same time. Could I just take you back? I mean, this, this business of of the official response and, as it were, the people's response, that though we claim in India a credit for inscribing the crime of apartheid on the agenda of the United Nations, and therefore say that we have established our credentials, yeah. if you look at the record in 1946, what we were doing, what we did, and from 1946 until 1952, was to claim that the discrimination against people of Indian origin in South Africa was wrong. We made no case at all for the fact that the same laws applied in even harsher measure uh, to the black Africans. So even in what we claim as our greatest triumph, um, we were being, in a way, uh, discriminatory. We were discriminating between the black Africans and the Africans of well, Indian origin. Well, some people would say Mahatma Gandhi did that himself. His, 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 his transformation is because of racism against Indians, not against, because of racism against Absolutely. Africans. Absolutely. And Mahatma's own response to Africans, his own description of Africans, sadly, was, was extremely racist. Okay. Well, before we go off on this tangent, uh, Master Vishnathan, now uh, let me come back to why we don't recognize racism as racism. You know, for a country which has an established system of discrimination based on caste, class, gender, ethnicity, and color consciousness, why are we scared of calling a spade a spade and say that Indians display racist attitude towards Africans and we need to do something about it? See, here, uh I can understand the government cannot uh, shout from rooftops that these are racist attacks. There are constraints involved. But at least what the government can do or government, uh, top government people can do is to avoid insensitive statements that go out of the way to say these are only minor scuffles or to say that no, no, these kind of uh, crimes happen anywhere in the world. And the other problem is sometimes we have a tendency to throw technicalities at this. About uh, two or three years ago, when there was such an incident, I don't remember, in one of the states, not in Delhi, one Indian uh, high up in Delhi smugly remarked that they should know that in India, law and order is a state subject. Is that the answer you give to the parents who have lost yes. a son? I mean, these are insensitivities which we should avoid. And one more point, the point is of perception that India is considered generally a racist country also because the foreigners see what is happening in India and the kind of craze for whitening creams. And India is perhaps the only country where leave alone women, even men use whitening creams and celebrities endorse the products. Yeah, it's not only about whitening. For example, uh, there's discrimination in uh, uh, North India and even in South India against people from the Northeast who are, you know, as fair or as uh, whatever, uh, white, uh, you know, as you can get in India. So it's not about color, it's also about ethnicity, it's about difference, it's about lack of uh, ed education about people's culture. So we are not in well informed about our own culture, about our own people. What is the chance that we'll inform ourselves about Africans? Well, uh, you know, we, we, we need to introspect. Uh, and we need to uh, get over this mindset of you know that one ethnic community 
is, for example, superior to another ethnic group, uh, or that, you know, this part of the country is better than that part of the country, regionalism and things like that. Uh, I think, you know, there is room for introspection on this and to uh, change mindsets. Uh, even in the domestic context, uh, I mean, as you mentioned, there are some people from the Northeast complain about, uh, you know, discrimination and so on. And that has to be taken seriously and people have to be educated. All right. Yes. We need to take a break again at this point. We'll be back again in a bit. Stay with us. Don't go away. Welcome back. We're discussing racist attacks on Africans resident in India and the impact of these attacks or the possible imp uh, impact of these attacks on India-Africa relations. Ambassador Paul, how can India as a society assume collective responsibility and undertake systematic steps to end racial discriminations uh, against African nationals? What, what do we really need to do? I mean, it's good to say introspection, but you need to go beyond that. I think the point that Vish made is very important. Education uh, at, at every level. Um, our texts, our school texts, are themselves racist. In Kerala, for instance, when I was in the NHRC, I went to uh, a kindergarten where they were t teaching children uh, about values. And the, the example given were animals, a, a cow and a crow or something. And the point was made that even though the crow is black, I treat it well. So, I mean, so if, if children are being taught that sort of nonsense, then clearly we have a problem. We have a fundamental problem. So education, it has to start with education. Mr. Vishnu, I think could one of the reasons for this discrimination be that although Africans know a lot about India through their own independence struggle and you know what their leaders learned from uh, Gandhi and even from Nehru, Indians have very little knowledge, as you pointed out earlier, of uh, Africa or African struggles. They might know a little bit about South Africa, Nelson Mandela, but the rest of Africa really in, a, in the education uh, sector is, is a black continent, you know, black in the sense that you know nothing about it. Uh, how can we educate our people about Africa, uh, its food, cinema, music, art, culture, its people, the different ethnicities that live there? See, actually, even educated people in India think Africa is a country. I have been introduced in many times among my own peer group in other sectors, private sector, saying that he has been ambassador to Africa. So that is the level of ignorance. Now, on what should be done, there are two things. One is at the government level and one is at the societal level. Societal level, Ambassador Pal clearly pointed out there has to be greater awareness. We have to teach right from school about Africa so that people know what that continent is about. At the government level, it's very simple. The thing to be done is deterrence. The message should go loud and clear that any such attack, whoever involves in any such attack, will have a heavy price to pay. The question is, is that message going? After every incident, there are some FIRs filed, some arrests are made, then they come out on bail, nothing is known. Take, for example, the cases in the last two years. Can the government come out publicly, what has been done on the people who were involved. This has two advantages. One is it assuages the African community in India. And number two, the message goes across to potential attackers that they cannot get away with this. So that should be the message that should be going. But shouldn't we also facilitate uh, their stay in India in a proper manner? Because what is happening is that people, landlords refuse to rent them places. They live in ghettos. Why are they living in urban villages? Why are they not living amongst normal, uh, uh, you know, urban middle class? And why do these ghettos move from one place to the other? If there's attack in one village, then almost they move to some other place. The same thing happens there. So why doesn't the government do something? It's not a question of deterrence here. The question here is one of facilitation and punishing those who refuse to rent uh, accommodation to Africans on racial grounds. Uh, Yes, and uh, the thing is, there are some complaints that some of the Africans indulge in uh, drug peddling and all that. It may be true, but it is not for the African ambassadors and high commissioners to catch them, because that is not their job and they are not equipped with that. It is for our law and order agencies, if they find yeah. that uh, there are uh, criminals among them, then uh, arrest them and uh, deport them to their country. Well, Srivastava, even when we say they are drug peddlers, We've had ministers of some state governments 
identifying them with nationalities, saying people of this country are drug peddlers. Now, uh, if there is lack of education amongst uh, elected representatives, what is the chance of ed uh, their educating their constituents? Well, I do think that uh, media also has an important role to play in this. Uh, because media, media's reach is very wide. Uh, and this includes the print media, the visual media, electronic media. Uh, and uh, they should, people should be made aware of these facts and also should be, should be persuaded that it does not help in, if you stereotype you know, the Africans. How do we feel if Indians are stereotyped in some foreign countries? We, we do not feel good. And so I think stereotyping is something which uh, is hurtful. The second thing is that uh, this morning's papers have reported that the uh, you know, Deputy Commissioner of Police of the North, North Division held a meeting yesterday with the Resident Welfare Association and a group of Africans staying in those, the, that locality and had a frank discussion with them. And this, is a, this, is, this needs to be done more frequently and on a much wider scale uh, because this will instill confidence. Okay. Ambassador Paul, do you think India's history of diplomatic support for democracy, opposition to colonialism, racial discrimination will continue to resonate with um, the next generation of African uh, youngsters? Or if these uh, events in India continue, they'll say this is all bogus? The past is the past. Uh, it, it is important, but you can't place an overdue importance on it. It's what you do now that matters. And, and clearly what India does or what India is trying to do, what Prime Minister Modi's uh, interest in developing much closer relations with Africa, that will have an impact. But all that will be vitiated if Africans who are here are being killed or beaten up or living with sort of daily tensions and, and racial slurs. And, and, and therefore, clearly, what the government of India wishes to do uh, for its, in its own interest yeah. will, will, be, uh, will, will be put to jeopardy if we don't get our racism here under control. Okay. Ambassador Vishnathan, uh, the Indian diaspora in Africa is estimated to be about 1 million. Actually, it's 2 million. 2 million? Okay, 2 million people. And there's a uh, World Bank survey of 2007 which says that of all the international firms op uh, operating there, 48% of the company owners were Indians who had taken African citizenship. Um, so, which means they are substantially uh, more integrated into African society than their other uh, foreign counterparts. Now, how will these overseas uh, Indians or Indians of, uh, or, or let's say African citizens of Indian origin be affected uh, if these developments continue? Uh, as I said, uh, sporadic events, uh, it may not be noticed, but if it goes on on a continuous scale, then uh, it's only natural that they would react. Uh, to our uh, Indian uh, people of Indian origin in those countries. Yeah. For example, in, if you are con continuously attacking the Nigerians and the Congolese here, uh, back in Congo and Nigeria, it's only human behavior that uh, they say that, I mean, these people are coming and making a lot of money and when our brothers and sisters go to India, they are being treated. So one has to be sensitive on this. Do you want to say something on this? Well, I want to make the point about the general image of India. And uh, as, I, as Ambassador Paul said that, you know, the first generation which studied in the 1950s, they remember the anti-apartheid struggle, anti-colonial. But the new generation, they, they are not necessarily aware of that. They will judge you by your behavior at the moment. And I think that it is very important that we appear to be a fair uh, law-abiding and non-discriminatory in our approach yeah. to the Africans. Okay, so we are running out of time, but uh, uh, last question to you. If these attacks on Africans continue, and I hope they don't, I'm sorry to ask this question again and again. Will India's image in Africa still derive any positive benefits or none at all? Because you're saying the past is past from, uh, you know, our relationship with the leaders like uh, Julius Nerere of Tanzania, Kenneth Konda of Zambia, Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana. You know, these were uh, big figures even in India. When they came, you know, people turned up in the streets to see them. Now, it's, it, and, and Africans, you know, it sent a positive message to Africa. Is that all gone, finished? 
Well, if you ask uh, an, an Indian student now uh, to tell you who Kwame Nkrumah was, even Nelson, Nelson Mandela, I suspect, he wouldn't know or she wouldn't know. So if we've forgotten it in India, you can't expect Africans of this generation to remember, particularly because what we did for them is perhaps not as central to their experience as we would like to believe. So it is important that we, as it were, continuously do something for Africa, which is now the fastest growing continent in the world. So in our own self-interest, which I think the Prime Minister acknowledges and realizes, we need to engage more with Africa. Well, I hope he personally engages more absolutely, and says something. Absolutely. All right. We've really run out of time. I'd like to thank you, Ambassador Neer Srivastava, Ambassador HSS Vishwanath and Ambassador Satyabrat Pal for participating in this discussion. That is all we have for you today. We'll be back again as usual next week. Until then, goodbye and thanks for watching India's work.